In this edition of Detroit Performs, a comedy theater engages and educates through their witty, creative, and hilarious craft. It's making a difference in someone's day. It's, you know, uh, when they come here, you know, they leave their jobs behind, they leave all the stress behind. Getting them to laugh is a gift. I mean, it's a gift for us to be able to do that, I think. Critic Card Detroit shares citizen reviews on ArtX. All of the rich history of Detroit and all of the creativity was just awesome. An artist's lighter take on life. I want it to sort of entertain. I want it to, it's, it's not serious. I mean, the world is serious enough. But, you know, it's just nice to create art that kind of is fun. And a writer explores a cemetery to discover the unknown history of Detroit. There's actually a battleground inside of Elmwood Cemetery. In 1763, the British, who were under siege by the Indians, tried to sneak up on the encampment of Chief Pontiac, but he knew they were coming, and he slayed the British forces. It's all ahead in today's episode of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and I am so excited to be showing you around Detroit's historic gym theater today. Now, I am in the outdoor gardens of the gym, and let me tell you, the look and the smell of these flowers is an art in itself. Now, our first segment is a group of performers who are absolutely hilarious. However, they take their work very seriously. In fact, there are three principles they always follow, integrity, innovation, and inspiration executing their three eyes for the benefit of the audience, themselves, and the community. Here is Go Comedy Improv Theater. Improv comedy is the art of uh, making something out of nothing. So whenever we do a show, we don't have any idea what it's gonna be. Uh, we get a suggestion from the audience, and based on what they tell us, uh, do scenes and songs uh, based just off of that. Maybe the type of vegetable you might find in a farmer's market. Yeah. Cucumber. Cucumber, I heard. Thank you, cucumber. We take you to wrong. <laughs> the comedy comes from the truth of it. It comes from being in the moment and, and listening to what uh, that other person is doing and, and helping to move that along. Um, it's, it's not really about being the funniest person or being the wittiest. It's about being with that, that, that other performer or whoever else is there. Yeah, you want to see it? What are you doing? I'm doing it! You want to see it? I'm doing it! I'm afraid! Everybody here, as we say, like, we all have each other's backs, you know what I mean? And um, everybody here wants um, the next guy to succeed and, you know, do well. And um, everybody here uh, wants to collaborate with each other, you know what I mean? And because improv is like, you know, it's a, it's a group, it's a group effort. We're in the middle. <laughs> We've got nights that are just short form, like game sort of uh, uh, shows. And that's usually on our Friday and Saturday nights. That's our show that's kind of like, whose line is it anyway? Where it's, it's, um, uh, games that the uh, the improvisers play and then we have um, evenings where uh, it's more long form and scenic uh, uh, shows uh, and then we also have our scripted shows that come from long form improvisation uh, we also have our karaoke improv night on Sundays where anybody can come and try out and they can uh, uh, you know sign up on the list and we bring you up and tell you how to do it and you get to try it out and see if you love it like <laughs> most of the people here as Led Zeppelin rocks, and Jimmy Cage pulls you up to do a guitar solo. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of different improv philosophies. I mean, the way we approach it is that improv is something that everybody does. Uh, when, when you're a kid, it's called make-believe, um, and it's not hard to do. You just make stuff up. Uh, if there's dinosaurs, there's dinosaurs, and no one questions, you know, what era they're from. You just, they're dinosaurs, and you play. 
uh, and kind of the older you get, the more you stop trusting your creative uh, sources and we kind of try and teach adults how to play like kids again. Um, and that's kind of the common through line in all of improv is the idea of yes and. You, you always say yes no matter what. If somebody calls you out as something on stage and uh, uh, it's the craziest thing in the world, you just agree with it and you become whatever it is that they make you uh, because that furthers what's happening. And then the, the second part of that is the and and then you continue and you help to create as well. Anything could happen. You know, there's, there's been scenes where, you know, you see people, they, they drop their pants because the scene called for it, you know. Uh, but, I mean, that's, that's one of the things I admire about a lot of improvisers is that the fearlessness that they have. When you're in that moment, you don't think about anything else. You're, you're living that life for that brief minute or two or three. And after a set, an improv set, you know, it might be 25 minutes, you have five or six scenes in there. If you're in the moment in all of those scenes, you get off stage and you're not going to remember it necessarily just because you're so into what you're doing that you're not mentally taking notes of everything that's going on, which is the best sets I've ever had when you don't know what happened. It's almost like you almost get like I don't I almost feel like I'm in a trance almost and then when I get off stage I like snap out of it. You know what I mean? Like come back to reality kind of thing. I miss my family. Dan came back three weeks ago. Where were you? Wow. Third player detected to begin calibration. Please stand in front of connect. No! I really like just building something and creating something, you know, with, you know, my fellow improvisers. When you're improvising with other people, the goal is to make it just as funny as possible, make it as quick as possible, and, you know, just have it, like, have this nice, like, just a nice flow to the scene. When you just go out there and um, have fun. The best shows are definitely when I have fun. You know, when I'm, like, really enjoying it and, um, not thinking about anything else. Sarah, she's going through withdrawals. Drug addiction, classic. Worse. I got a clue the jellies. Candy Crush. This is serious. <laughs> you can feel the energy come from the crowd, from the audience. And when we feel that energy, we, you know, we give that energy right back to them. Yes. Yes. I heard that the killer, he would always give wedding gifts of an appliance. <laughs> like a toast. Making people laugh is so rewarding. Uh, I mean, it's sometimes it's a little thing, but it's making a difference in someone's day. It's, you know, uh, when they come here, you know, they leave their jobs behind, they leave all the stress behind. You know, getting them to laugh, is, it's a gift. I mean, it's a gift for us to be able to do that, I think, um, because it really does make a difference in people's lives. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I don't have a business degree. I don't, you know, I don't work for Greenpeace, but this is what I can give back, and I do it pretty well, and I feel lucky that I get to. To find out more about Go Comedy Improv Theater and all the artists featured in today's show, visit DetroitPerforms.org. Now, the gym's history is filled with tidbits of fascinating historical moments. For instance, when its doors were opened in 1903, the Century Club was given the first building permit ever issued under a woman's name in Detroit. Now, I'll continue with more interesting gyms, including how this theater got its current location after these Credit Card Detroit reviewers gives us an in-depth look into Art X. It's been such an amazing experience so far. The, the art here is amazing, the food was great, and we're so excited for the rest of the weekend. I'm Anne Marie Barucki, and I'm here with Midtown Detroit, Inc., the producer of Art X Detroit. And we're here at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit to kick off Art X Detroit, the Kresge Arts Experience. It is so consistent with the things that are happening around Detroit these days. I saw John Donovan's work. It's, it's disturbing and fantastic. 
and evocative. The vibe is really cool. I'm around all these other artsy fartsy people like myself. Hi, I'm Rip Rapson. I'm president of the Kresge Foundation in Detroit. And I think ArtX is stunning, not just for all of the vibrancy that it has for the here and now, but for what it suggests about a future Detroit. A swirl of artistic expression going on. It's kind of like our own Detroit South by Southwest. We got film, we got art, we got music. All of the rich history of Detroit and all of the creativity was just awesome. And she brought back so much memories. Hear the sounds, the sights, the mood, the music, the pulse of a time that's long gone. There's a lot of like hybrid objects, uh, you know, maybe two cultures kind of merged into one vessel. These early artists sacrificed for the things that we take for granted as African-American artists. It was nice to have a movie that read her poetry where we felt we got to know her. Informative, educational, and rewarding. They call it World Without Borders, so it's a collaboration with other musicians from around the world. And it just felt like, like we were immersed in these cultures that were all working together, and it was beautiful. Very multicultural, lots of different instruments that I've honestly never even heard of. I went to the DIA, and they had jazz. I went to the Science Center. They had rap. And I guess this is uh, Motown. Motown right now here at the Majestic. This is my first experience with Terry Peak. It's kind of a, an out-of-body experience. Jazz band, just kind of stream of conscious feel the way. Riding the elevator up and down. So good that we danced in the elevator up and down maybe like three times. It's um, theater and it's at its simplest and then theater at its really in an involved kind of state artistically. Provoking the theater of the mind. The use of metaphor, uh, the depth of the language and the storytelling takes you back to the tradition of griots that go all the way back to the mother continent. It was like a blues, it was a, it was a poem, it was a story, it was a telling, and it was sexy. <laughs> it's an enormous amount of depth and intelligence and creativity. We have so much talent here in Detroit. I am blown away. Uh, it's an 11, not a 10. I'm leaving inspired and excited about doing more great work about Detroit, Detroit's history, and, and excited to see what happens next for Detroit. It's just absolutely thrilling weekend. For what it's worth, it's here, it's now. Art X. I sit way back in the very last row. I still had Saturday night on my breath. You can view more Credit Card Detroit Citizen Reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel, which you can find through DetroitPerforms.org. Now, in 1997, Comerica Park could have demolished the gym, but instead, developer Charles Forbes decided to relocate the structure to the corner of Madison and Brush. The transfer broke the Guinness Book World Record as the heaviest building ever moved on wheels. Now our next artist's diverse background in illustration and drawing led him to create his quirky signature paintings. Michael Barrara's unique cityscapes captures iconic places in colorful three-dimensional pieces. Oftentimes the scale ends up growing as I'm sort of starting out with this small little uh, sketch or drawing on a, on a napkin. And then it just becomes like, it starts unraveling to, into something much, much bigger. And that is kind of what has happened with this piece. It sort of got away from me, and then I had to sort of lasso it back in. It's a massive 10-foot 3D painting, which is actually built in four sections. So there's a front section right here, and then, and then there's a, a middle and two sides, and they they interweave in together, sort of lock in together. It's interactive in the sense that, you know, people can really see that there's, uh, there's things that are, would otherwise be hidden, uh, like a UPS truck. I want it to sort of entertain. I want it to, it's, it's not serious. I mean, the world is serious enough. That, you know, it's just nice to create art that kind of is fun. I'm recognizing known places in our city and I'm bringing it to this crazy, whimsical level. 
I think one of the reasons I paint in a style that I do is I really never could realistically draw. <laughs> I couldn't uh, make something look like a picture or a photograph. I would try and kind of fail miserably. I um, come from kind of a background of illustration, cartooning and uh, caricature. I think it was my junior year of college. I came across a guy that was drawing caricature portraits uh, at the, the Minnesota Zoo. I kind of asked him what got him into that, and then I kind of got into it that way. You know, as a illustration major, it was really nice to be able to apply my major in some way, even if it was just uh, doing just live drawings of people, you know, for a couple dollars here and there. And then one thing led to another, and then Canvas started to kind of get a little boring to me, and I kind of wanted to push the boundaries of different work surfaces. You know, the first thing that really I started kind of playing around with was uh, plywood and painting on a, a plywood surface. It was kind of like I, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no, no clue, but, you know, I just thought to myself, I kind of would love to see some sort of three-dimensionality to it, and how would I pull this off? If it's maybe a brick building, it's I'm working on using textures out of a, what I use is a pastry bag and I take uh, these gel medium uh, textures and then uh, sort of fill it into the pastry bag and, and kind of just kind of use it to, you know, almost draw on the, on the wood. The texture has kind of the consistency of like a cake frosting, so it's like frosting a cake. It took me a while to kind of learn the control of uh, the stuff as a mind of its own. You know, it was just a lot of evolution of trying different things and pushing the scale element of it, making these paintings bigger and, and taking them on in, a, in something that maybe I hadn't tried before to the point where I feel kind of uncomfortable about it. And that's, that's for me, that's a good, that's when good things start to happen. It's really weird for me how popular the art has become. I almost feel a little bit embarrassed by it. It's not something you plan a career to do. I think that people really are drawn to the work because it's the memory of a place that they have a fondness for. You know, something like Mancini's, like people that have this fondness for Mancini's, they see the, the facade and they see how it's all lit up and they just make this connection to these memories. I'm looking for something that has this sort of fantastically unique feel about it. You know, I feel really lucky that I am recognized for this. I know there's artists that just, they're pounding the pavement to try to sell a piece of art and they're doing whatever they can and there's a lot of talent there. I feel really lucky that it, it has worked out in a relatively smooth way for me. I think the next Burr Hour piece should be of Detroit Cityscape. You can learn more about him by visiting DetroitPerforms.org. And now, here are the events happening this week around Detroit.
Today, the gym has settled into its home at the corner of Madison and Brush, leaving behind its performance roots to become a premier location for weddings, special events, and where people can revel in its antiquity. And just as I was interested in the gym's past, writer Amy Elliott Bragg was intrigued by Detroit's unknown history. So she decided to uncover it by exploring Detroit's Elmwood Cemetery. Now here she is with snippets from the book her discoveries inspired. Before I started writing about Detroit history, I thought Detroit history went like this. French fur traders founded it, something, something, something. There was a fire at some point, and then Henry Ford started making cars. So I wanted to find out what happened in those 200 years in between. I first started coming to cemeteries because I wanted to make a personal connection to the people that I had been reading about in history books. And I think a cemetery is one of the few places that really drives home how these were real people who had real lives in the city. Elmwood is a great place to get a sense of Detroit history. It's the final resting place of governors, mayors, captains of industry, senators, soldiers, rock stars, and everyone in between. This is Joseph Campo. He's buried here in Elmwood, all alone on this hillside. The rest of his family is buried in Mount Elliot, the Catholic cemetery across the fence. Joseph Campo was a French Catholic, like most of the Detroiters of the day, um, but he was kind of a nonconformist. He was a merchant who was selling booze to the Indians. He was also a Mason. And after a high profile feud with Gabriel Richard, the French Catholic priest of Detroit, Joseph Campo had finally had enough and he left the Catholic Church which is why he's here by himself with all of his family across the way. There's actually a battleground inside of Elmwood Cemetery. In 1763, the British, who were under siege by the Indians, tried to sneak up on the encampment of Chief Pontiac, but he knew they were coming and he slayed the British forces. There were about 60 casualties that day and the battle came to be known as Bloody Run because the river, this one right here, where they were fighting, uh, was said to have run red with the blood of British soldiers. Um, this over here is the Scott Fountain. It was built by Cass Gilbert, the same architect who designed the U.S. Supreme Court building. This fountain almost didn't get built. When Jim Scott died in 1910, he left most of his estate to the city of Detroit to build this fountain with the condition that the city also build a life-size statue of Jim Scott. He owned several pharaoh houses throughout the city, which were gambling houses. He liked to tell long-winded stories and body jokes, and he was kind of spiteful. Um, in one famous incident, he built a building called the Scots Folly, a giant, beautiful Victorian mansion at the corner of Park and Peterborough. His neighbor wouldn't sell him the adjoining land, so he made the house that he built as beautiful as possible from the front, and in the back he built a three-story brick wall to uh, block his neighbor's view. Ultimately, the Detroit City Council decided to build the fountain along with the statue. Jim Scott in life had been kind of a dapper dresser. He liked to wear bow ties and silk vests, and he was rarely seen without a big top hat, which you can see the statue doesn't have. Uh, so the hope was that no one would recognize him without it. To find out more information on Amy and her book, Hidden History of Detroit, check out DetroitPerforms.org. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. For more information on arts and culture, visit DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook. Now, we'd like to thank the gym for having us here today. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show them how Detroit performs. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.